Okay, so let's uh, you know get started. And, and as I said, you know it's a smaller gathering today, so we can keep it as interactive as you know as needed. You know, um, so we are here. So I hope assignment three submission went okay. Um, you know, there is no right or wrong answer for both the. Uh, I mean, there's different degrees of effort you, you can put for both part one and part two. Uh, you know, if, even if you're able to build, for example, a basic language translation from, let's say, English to your chosen language, and if you're able to even, you know, reverse, do the reverse in, you know, in, in simplest way, that's good enough. Okay, that, that's, that's like the to get the architecture correct and in the code correct is is important than trying to chase the last few decimals or you know going from 60% accuracy to 70%. It's, it's, that's not needed. Um, but I hope that was interesting because that is the um, kind of core of any other more fancy stuff that you see people demo or people do in their own professional uh, projects. Uh, it starts from there. Okay, you can always kind of robustify it and and you know package it and talk about it on blogs, things like that. That's what folks do. Uh, so it's, I hope it was an interesting learning experience doing uh, RNN-based modeling. So the next uh, assignment is actually um, due about a month from now. But do note that uh, it's right before a week before the project uh, part, and project is a you know greater than fifty percent comprehensive course. So, um, uh, so so try to at least get started on the assignment based on so assignment four is based on today's lecture and and the next actually it's based on the next three lectures. Uh, but uh, but you can get started on the first part based on what we talked today. Uh, I'll not discuss the assignment right now. Maybe uh, when we are at least midway, maybe the next lecture or the lecture after that, I'll discuss it. Okay. Um, yeah. So with that, um, let me directly start with a fresh topic, okay? Which is online learning. So we'll cover today. Uh, um, so we briefly mentioned, we briefly talked about online learning last time. So it's okay if you've forgotten. We're going to look at what is the online learning paradigm and how does it differ from supervised learning? Okay, that's the biggest takeaway that you should have from this today's lecture as well as the next three lectures. Okay, there is some need for reinforcement learning, and that's why people are interested in it, right? So it, it, it is somehow different from uh, supervised learning somehow in a fundamental way, and identifying that uh, uh, is important. But at the same time, you know, uh, it's not easy to apply these approaches, online learning approaches. They are still maturing. AV testing, of course, is quite mature, but uh, beyond that, it really depends on who's in a team, what is the maturity level of your organization and stuff. Um, so today's goal is to really understand what is online learning, how does it differ from supervised learning, and, and we'll actually not do an explicit comparison, but we'll give hints along the way of why, it will, why it's different. And uh, we'll briefly talk about, and, uh, at the very beginning, we'll talk about the link between forecasting and decision making may not be simple, okay? It may not be that the poor, the forecasting or the prediction variable itself is like the decision, decision variable, like give a loan, don't give a loan, or things like that. It they may not be that simple. And then uh, the bulk of today's discussion is about uh, um, doing something like A-B testing, as in figuring out which action or which decision to make uh, in an online learning setting, which is that you keep learning, keep getting feedback, keep learning. And we'll talk about the details in a second. Um, so much of the... Uh, uh, discussion is about a particular approach called multi on bandits, uh, which are also old, okay, from 1980s, actually, uh, at least in the operations research literature, uh, and even maybe in the computer science literature from that time. Um, but they are interesting technology to uh, think about, and they solve a particular problem. And we'll talk about what problem they solve after we look at AB testing, because it, you'll see from AB testing, there's some issues, and uh, there's one issue, and, and we'll kind of fix that using bandits. And we'll talk about what is the problem, what is the solution approach here. Uh, and the reason why we, it's being introduced is this is like the simplest um, reinforcement learning setting. Okay, so RL, where uh, we saw um, you know self-driving car and stuff like that. You know that's all very interesting, uh, much more complicated situations. multi arm bandits and contextual bandits are like the simplest versions of RL problems. So that's the uh, goal uh, for today. So. First, AV testing, next, uh, multi arm bandits, and then contextual versions of it. And they are precursors to reinforcement learning that we'll talk about after the spring break. Okay. So let's uh, get started. 
So uh, the first 20 minutes or so is going to be, again, quite general. And uh, at the same time, if it's general, I hope it's not too boring. And so if it's boring, we can skip over some of the, some of the slides. Um, but basically, we are trying to make a transition. Okay, so, so we over the past several lectures, we've been really looking at popular architecture in each class, like feed power network or convolutional network or recurrent network or transformer architecture or GANs or VAEs. They're all, you know, a, you know, and there are hundreds of variations of each one of them, right? But we've been looking at that collection of models and uh, some of them were um, focused on supervised learning and majority of them were focused on supervised learning. And now we are kind of departing from, kind of departing from this um, uh, focus only on forecasting or only on learning to kind of tie back to decision making. Because at the end of the day, build models, they have to move some needles, okay? Some uh, KPIs that the business is tracking essentially, right? So there is some going to be some link to uh, businesses, uh, business objectives, and businesses make decisions, right? What type of decisions do they make? Generally, you know, pricing, inventory management, or if, for example, if it's Uber, it has to match drivers to riders, for example, and, and things like that. So there's going to be many different types of decisions firms make, right? Uh, depending on their um, domain and so on. Um, and 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 so the next uh, few lectures, in fact, the remaining part of the course, is now you know, kind of ignoring just forecasting and basically looking at the bigger picture, which is uh, really decisions, how to take good decisions. And one variation of that problem of how to take good decisions is not via batch process. So much of what we saw in the previous um, uh, eight lectures or so is a batch process. So you have, some, you already have the data, uh, whether it's supervised or unsupervised, and you're building models out of it. Uh, from today and, and next lectures, uh, so on, you'll see there's an online component. And that's why the today's lecture is called online learning, where you're gonna kind of retrain. It's like doing a batch process in a for loop, like again and again and again, but there has to be something different each time, not just fresh data. Uh, you have to kind of evolve your models. Okay? So that's kind of the uh, uh, change. So uh, let's talk about, uh, uh, you know, motivated again. So in the introductory class, we said, hey, we wanna look at uh, complex prediction problems. And that was basically images, text, and so on, which were a little bit harder to handle with uh, vanilla or, or a little bit harder to handle with the types of models we saw before, like SVMs or random forests. Uh, we also briefly discussed complex decisions, okay, which is basically um, trying to take feedback into account to, uh, you know, figure out insurance premia, for example, if you're an insurance company uh, for a neighborhood based on uh, the houses, the flood risk and all that, uh, you define a premium and then maybe some houses, you know, need insurance, you know, do an insurance payout. And then maybe next year you revise the premium based on your, your risks that you see in the neighborhood or the region, for example. So there's that you need to make decisions and you, you get feedback, okay? Uh, and so uh, data-driven decisions, uh, there are many variations of it, batch process, and then making decisions is one of them, but we'll, we'll be mostly concerned with the online machine learning where there's a kind of an infinite for loop, okay? Uh, so that's for today. And then reinforcement learning in the next couple of lectures and kind of end with the, uh, joining this back to deep neural network architectures uh, and that will be deep reinforcement learning okay uh, okay so this is just an example to kind of say hey what is a complex decision this is just a prototypical example uh, slide deck it's this is not the only example uh, for example routing i just mentioned uh, not just matching a driver to a um, a for example passenger by companies like uber or lyft uh, but routing right so if you are a, if you have uh, 100 trucks and you need to uh, go from point A to point B for like uh, shipping uh, cargo, then uh, you need to route through routes based on uh, fuel and then stops and uh, driver schedules because they cannot drive for more than X hours. A lot of, you know, those are really complex decision-making problems. And this is ignoring all forecasting, like ignoring machine learning. You may just have, even if you know, uh, like uh, cost of fuel, you know, delay on a particular route and uh, driver schedules, even then, uh, you know, finding out the best solution there is hard, typically. Um, so that's what I mean by complex decisions, like uh, resource allocation, like who to provide customer service if you have limited resources, or uh, how much unit of each item to purchase or place an order for, depending on lead time, lag time. I think in the other courses that you might have done, if it's electives, for example, inventory management or revenue management, you will see this, these types of problems. Um, but let's come back to, uh, but we'll kind of, the, the types of complex decisions I'm talking about, you know, whatever they are, they will generally be backed by forecasts, forecasts of, you know, how, how uh, future will look like, how future demand will look like and so on. There's always forecasting 
uh, that's that's a, a step before doing the decisions. But we'll look at a version where there will be some forecasting, there will be some decision making, and there will be the feedback. Okay, so that's that's kind of important, and uh, and we'll briefly discuss why that is slightly different from batch supervised learning. Okay, as we go along uh, later. But let me talk about uh, the the you know kind of friend load the teaser, which is as I said, the sequence is online machine learning, uh, reinforcement learning, and deep reinforcement learning. Uh, but let me friend load and give a teaser of why why we're looking at reinforcement learning. Right? It seems promising today. Okay. Uh, it may not be promising five years from now, who knows, but uh, at least this particular magazine uh, said, you know, uh, reinforcement learning is one of, is a big breakthrough technology. This was back in 2017. Um, it hasn't made as much breakthrough, uh, relatively speaking, compared to, uh, let's say, transformers or something else, but, you know, there's still a lot of promise, okay? And that's because it really marries decision making and uh, forecasting. Um, the breakthroughs have been happening, actually, uh, some of the, I guess, big changes have been happening uh, with respect to decision making in in a very uh, in some domains, like one of them actually from a decade ago, actually 2012, is this uh, uh, demo uh, or this uh, result by Google uh, researchers or DeepMind researchers who showed how to how they how they could build a you know deep reinforcement learning uh, uh, you know model or or an algorithm which could learn to play uh, these. Uh, these Atari games. Okay, there are several. So each one is a screenshot of a different game. Okay, um, and uh, uh, so the same architecture and uh, was used with the same hyperparameters was used to uh, train uh, on each one of them separately, and then it could, it could really do well on each one of the games. Okay, as good as humans, roughly. So, um, but to do that, there is data collection. You know, data collection, learning some models, predictive models, forecasting models. And making decisions, which is the you know joystick decisions, getting feedback, score feedback, and then kind of based on the score feedback, uh, you kind of uh, potentially also get new data and use that to kind of update your way to choose joystick decisions. Okay, so that's that's the for loop um, we'll look at. The second example is uh, uh, a deep reinforcement learning agent from 2016, and uh, in 2016 itself, which is six years ago, was able to beat uh, then uh, top ranked player um, Lee et al in a very well publicized uh, uh, event. So where the, where the RL based agent won uh, four is to one in a five game series. And since then the, uh, the approaches, the uh, software is much better than uh, humans now today uh, in the game of Go as it was there, as it is the case for chess. Okay, chess uh, software is like way leaps, leaps ahead of uh, the best human players. Similarly, that's the case here. Um, Okay, so with that, let's actually uh, get started with uh, online machine learning. And it's, as I said, it's a very simple template where, uh, where if you hide the training part, okay, so there's a, so there's a machine learning part. Uh, I'm just going to focus on the online part of this, okay. And machine learning part kind of it's implicit in this uh, discussion, okay, which is uh, you are you as an agent, as a firm, as a service provider, a SaaS company, whatever, uh, you observe the state of uh, the world or the domain wherever you're operating, like some context, basically you observe a feature vector, okay? You observe a feature vector, you choose an action, for example, a label, okay? If, if you want to map it back to supervised learning, choose a label and you get a feedback on the chosen label or action that you took, okay? So, uh, so you get a feedback and then what you could do is, hey, uh, going from features to labels, maybe you already have batch data and you figured out a good model which goes from context to action or whatever features to labels. And then you can keep using that as is. So, so although you're getting feedback, uh, you can keep using the same model. And then maybe after you accumulate some amount of feedback, then you can take that data as new data, incremental data and update your model. Okay? So that's the learning part, which I'm hiding in this for loop. Okay? You, you could do that type of learning, uh, but what's more interesting is that um, you take this action, you get some feedback, um, that feedback is for the chosen action. So if you, if you say, uh, you know, I, I think last time I was clarifying this and this is important even for a slightly related data called causal inference is that if given the feature vector, I say, hey, this is a cat, okay? The feedback I get is not gonna say, hey, this is not a cat, this is, a, this is actually a dog. That's not the feedback. The feedback will just say, hey, this is not a cat. Okay? You don't know what, if, if you show some other action, whether that is the right action or not. So you, you get very limited information, okay? That's very different from supervised learning where you have uh, you have the true label as well. 
the best action that you could take is also given kind of. Um, and the goal is generally to, uh, generally this feedback is considered, uh, you know, just like loss function. Uh, it's not a loss function. Uh, yeah, you can consider it as a loss function or a, or a positive reward signal. And then you can, you kind of focus on maximizing this feedback. Like, hey, I want to get the best and best feedback. Uh, like think of rating, right? So if you do something, you get a high rating, you kind of want to keep doing the same thing so that you get high and high rating uh, at different, different contexts that you see. Okay. Um, for today's lecture, we'll keep something simple, which is uh, the agent. So the agent is one who's, uh, who's uh, taking action. Agent is the, you know, the terminology we'll use, the person who's taking action. In, the, in our case, it's gonna be the software or whatever, our Python function our code basically. Uh, the assumption is that uh, our action will not influence future context. Okay. Uh, so why is this uh, um, an assumption that I'm bringing up here is, is that, you know, uh, you'll see that um, there will be some, you know, if you take a bad action today uh, that leads to a very bad customer experience that will not influence the next tomorrow's customers. Okay. That, that may not be correct. For example, if you think of a seller on an e-commerce website, you know, uh, they sell, uh, you know, inferior quality product, they'll get low rating, low rating will lead to uh, not the right demand, you know, tomorrow or, or the next month. Okay. But that we are kind of ignoring that. Okay. So, uh, and, the, and, and we'll see an example. And in fact, this example makes sense that, that, that the, the list of articles that I as an agent show to a user, the user comes to this website, I show a bunch of articles and maybe they don't like it. That has nothing to do with the next user coming. Uh, at least in a short time, a short enough time period. Uh, so, so in this uh, uh, application, which is uh, just the front page of a uh, website, uh, uh, the the loop is as follows: right, the user arrives with some information, the context, the feature vector, and then uh, the company, uh, in this case, chooses uh, some some things to put on the, on the website. That's the action. Okay, the action need not be just a label. It can be hey take article one, five, and six uh, to show to this user because maybe this user is interested in sports or maybe this user is interested in music or something, okay? And then uh, these are response by doing something, you know, navigating around the website, clicking and, you know, watching a video or whatever. And then you wanna choose uh, the content of whatever action you're taking to yield, uh, you know, whatever KPIs that you prefer, like high, high engagement, conversion, clicks, whatever. Okay? The assumptions are basically that the, what I show to one user does not affect the other user. Um, and even, and, and actually uh, kind of even simplistic, it's just saying that if the user comes tomorrow, they don't remember if they had a bad experience uh, the same day, okay? So these are all assumptions, which of course is not true. Uh, user having consistently bad experience, they will probably stop visiting your website or maybe unsubscribe from your app, okay? So there's all those issues, um, but you know, we'll stick with this version for now for, for building our intuition about why this is different from um, uh, supervised learning. And actually, uh, yeah, I can uh, mention that later, mention some things later. So here's the uh, uh, solution, how solution would look like. Okay, the solution itself is in the green box. We'll, we'll kind of unpack it. In fact, the way, right way we'll unpack it is all the way to the end of the lecture when we talk about contextual bandits. But, you know, it'll make sense. Uh, like, let's think of it as black box for now. So what it's doing is, you know, it kind of works the same way as a supervised learning black box, right? It takes a feature vector, user comes, gives them a feature vector, and you also probably know what are the features of the articles that you wanna potentially show, 50 articles maybe. You take that input and then maybe you rank those 50 articles into, hey, these are the most useful articles for them. And these are the less useful articles for them. And then, you know, based on limited, you know, maybe some area, you pick the top 10 articles and show it. And then you get some information, hey, they did spend a lot of time on a web page or whatever, they watched the video, you know, things like that, right? So really uh, everything is going on in here. And, this unit is supposed to learn, okay? So this feedback goes back in here and this unit is supposed to learn, okay? And uh, so if you think of supervised learning, this can also be supervised learning uh, box, right? Where I could have historical user information, historical articles, uh, I, what did they show? And then what did, how did they react to that? And that could be like a, you know, a observation example. And then based on that, I could build a supervised learning model. Um, there is going to be some challenges of supervised learning, and and we'll talk about it, uh, you know, in the contextual bandit uh, uh, part of the uh, lecture. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so the green box, uh, we want to get to the green box, um, and uh, without opening the green box for now, uh, what MSN at least uh, with this MSN.com, which is actually the website here, 
uh, what they showed even like six years ago uh, is that uh, you know it had lots of uh, requests per second and I mean, not that high but somewhat pretty pretty decent and uh, they were able to add you know they were this green box needed a little bit more overhead than just showing articles you know like a pre like a batch process would not have overhead but this green box had a little bit of overhead. Uh, and needed some servers for training, uh, a little bit different from supervised learning, uh, but was able to uh, have some latency for updating models. If you remember, we have to uh, behind the scene keep updating based on feedback. Was able to achieve a relative improvement, okay, which was uh, kind of significant, is what what they claim. Uh, and so, I mean, these numbers are very, by the way, uh, very hard to kind of change. Okay, in general, there is some performance of the population of your website. It's kind of very hard to go from. X percent to Y percent relative. Okay, so this is the type of numbers you'll see on the web, you know, web-related uh, uh, applications. But you know, they had this would be considered a pretty good success, so relatively improving some metric by a double-digit percent. Okay. Um, but anyway, so now let's actually, uh, uh, you know, we'll spend much of the time trying to kind of unwrap this green box. In fact, we'll keep it even simpler. Uh, uh, in the for the majority of the next hour, where we'll talk about A/B testing and uh, uh, multi-on bandits, where there is not going to be any user context. Okay, we ignore the user feature and just focus on uh, labeling uh, is what we'll try to look at. But there are a lot of applications. Um, uh, mostly, the ones are listed here are related to web, but uh, you can imagine uh, other applications where you want to take into feedback into account while improving your decisions. It could be related to pricing, for example. Uh, uh, there is at least on the research side, people have in our department also worked on this uh, idea of uh, you know, uh, you know changing prices based on uh, user context and actually learning from how users behave, behave to pricing, for example, uh, or it could be recommendations and other things. Um, yeah, so the I guess one aspect of the online machine learning uh, approaches is that typically they will need a uh, need a uh, need as an input a source of randomness. Okay. So they will, they'll basically, if you've done computer science courses or anything, they have some relation to randomized algorithms. So they will try to do some randomization. Okay? And we'll talk about that later. Um, any questions about this motivation? Uh, so is it pricing? Yes, yeah. So pricing is, a, so dynamic pricing is a phrase that you can look up. Uh, some of the faculty, yeah, who teach in fact revenue management, uh, have looked into it. Yeah, it will be a revenue, revenue management problem. Yes. Yeah. So generally, like firm decision making is generally uh, pricing or inventory control, basically, or uh, recommendations uh, or matching or routing. It depends on the domain, right? Uh, but these are all the types of decisions that, that companies or their software products have to make, right? Like even platforms have to make, right? If you go to uh, LinkedIn, you know, what list, what feed to show, or if you go to uh, Upwork, you know, how to match the uh, people who want to work to who people who have some work to be done. So those are platform type of problems, uh, which are also related to revenue management. Um, um, yeah, but, you know, you can apply the ideas today for any place where you need to kind of evolve based on feedback, okay? uh, where you are intervening because your actions will lead to you know what will happen if you take a certain action. So, sorry, you take an action, you only get feedback of whether that action is good or not. For example, think of pricing, right? If we, if I price something at ten dollars, I'll get some demand. But I don't know if I had price at eleven dollars and nine dollars, what would have been the demand? Unless maybe I try it out. And so there's some, uh, yeah, there's some non-triviality here compared to uh, supervised learning type of workflows. Okay. Um, So let's start with something simple, which is uh, relatively simple, which is A-B testing, and then we'll talk about multi on -manage. So A-B testing is uh, really about, although I showed you the online machine learning loop, uh, A-B testing is about, uh, in that loop, there's a third point, which is take feedback into account, or get feedback, right? Uh, so A-B testing is a version where you get feedback, but you don't change your actions. Okay, so there is, so, if you remember in that loop, there was a step two, which is get a context, take an action, right? So in A-B testing, you generally, there are two actions uh, for simplicity for this discussion. Let's say there are two actions, action A and action B, that's why it's A-B. And as, it, as the name testing implies, we are gonna actually do step two in a very crude way. We're just gonna randomly take an action A and randomly take an action B. Okay? 
And third step, we'll keep getting feedback. That's fine, but uh, we're not going to do any learning. You know, so in the in the in the if you think of the template, we will keep collecting the feedback, and after doing the after some time, we will accumulate the feedback and really then decide whether we should have we should continue to take action A forever or continue to take action B forever. Um, so, so typical scenario is basically, uh, you know, the competing ideas that are there, in, there for any product in product feature. And you'll see that uh, if you if you've participated in uh, um, teams which are like you know product focused, then they'll always have feature and they want to figure out whether the feature is actually effective in some business goal. Uh, and uh, typically, to convey that it does actually have an impact on business goal, unless you're directly selling and you have sales numbers or something. Uh, but if you are in like a web scale type of web type of situation, um, for example, you want to make the decision of whether the including the feature improves uh, something or not including the feature improves uh, something by doing a uh, doing what I call field observation okay, in the field, as in like in the real world. And so you pick uh, between action A and action B. So for example, action A is whatever the status quo is, and action B is the one with the extra feature. You want to figure out which one is better. That's what we, that's what A/B testing is about. Uh, there are lots of companies in this space. Uh, this is uh, Optimizely, for example, is pretty well known, uh, but there are many others. Um, and actually, uh, not just external companies, but uh, many bigger companies have their own internal huge teams, you know, 100,000 people uh, uh, working on uh, these, you know, instrumenting, setting up the infrastructure to do, be able to do these types of tests, okay? But which one is better? Which action is better uh, all the time, okay? So all the big, big names here. Uh, but they are not just for web. Uh, they can also be, in fact, the origination was from uh, the field of healthcare, clinical trials. Um, they also use not just for web properties, but also, you know, in general marketing, email, um, uh, many other domains. Okay. So it just depends on the suitability of uh, doing A versus B and, you know, and, and the risks associated with that. Okay. But analysis has comes later, but first you want to collect the data for testing. Yeah. Yeah, but in the end, what we're doing is we don't have a control group. We just have two tests. It's similar to statistical testing. Yeah, this is statistical testing. This is actually randomized control trial. So, uh, so we do have a control group here. So let me. So we are not doing anything advanced here. So let me just show you uh, in two slides what <laughs> what I mean. So we really, you know, we, so let's say some product feature. So. Some product team kind of innovates and hey, we should give coupons, and maybe coupons will lead to more, uh, uh, more uh, conversions. Let's say I'm just giving all the web related examples, but let's say the product that's the product feature. But uh, you know, it's unclear whether adding coupons actually increases, uh, let's say, sales or overall revenue or not. Then uh, what you can do is uh, uh, maybe you have offline, uh, offline hypothesis that maybe it does help. Okay, that's fine. But you really want to hit the field, or basically real world, test it out. Okay. And the way you do it is uh, action A is uh, for you, uh, show when user comes to your page, show first version. And when user comes to the page, show the second version. Okay, so that's, uh, those are the two actions that you could take and you take them at random. Okay? Uh, and, and then you eventually figure out after collecting the feedback, you went, the second stage, you figure out which, which action you should be taking for the future. Okay? Um, so any guess on which, which action is uh, better here or which decision is better here? Okay, so people are saying B, and the answer is not B. Uh, that's because it turns out, and, and but there is no right answer. Okay, if you do a, the same, maybe that's maybe today for a different company or a different website, maybe it's uh, B is better. But it turns out with this particular example, uh, it lost a lot of money because people just came to this page and then navigated away to find coupons, and then uh, it kind of lost the intent to purchase something here. So anyway, so there was some you know adverse effect of that, but. Uh, only by testing okay? and, and testing, you would kind of know that there is something more. Okay? If you understand everything about your system, then yeah, you don't need testing. Maybe if you have a really good approximation system and you, you know what happens when, when you do something. But here you don't know what user behavior is. For example, you're just a, you have a limited view, so you have to A-B test. Okay, so as I said earlier, we're gonna ignore the online aspect in the sense that the step two of taking actions uh, there is going to be context coming, but you're going to ignore the context. Okay, so users will have different contexts. Maybe as a student, maybe a professional, maybe a, um, uh, an elderly person, whoever that is, it doesn't matter. Um, and then taking actions, we're going to randomly take actions, action A, action B. 
and then we'll, we'll get feedback, but we're not really using the feedback immediately to kind of incrementally update our action choice. It's just going to be random for at least a period of the test. And then later on, we'll choose whether action A or action B to take for, a, for, the, for, the, for the future. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, as I said, it's about uh, showing two solutions and figuring out if solution A is different than solution B. Uh, and so you can imagine for the second part, it's actually going to be just a regular two sample test test. Okay. Um, so, uh, so we show two different solutions. So basically users come users, 50% of the users essentially see a control existing system and 50% of the users see the treatment version or the, you know, system with the extra feature. And then, uh, you know, so after maybe you, this people have been exposed to control and treatment for some amount of time, uh, which is achieved by randomly splitting, and this is super important. Then you do as part two, which is analyze, you know, I mean, you collect all the information, which is feedback, you know, either implicit or explicit. And then you analyze, you know, what, what is the right thing to thing we should do in the future. Um, so collect the outcomes and decide which option is better. Uh, actually compared to offline data analysis, uh, which uh, although it's called offline data analysis here, we have not seen much of this in either 575 or this course, or in 570, you know, or even 470, sorry, 572. Okay, so uh, that offline analysis called uh, uh, causal inference, causal inference with observational data. So you, if you intervene, or if you say, hey, let's add feature X, you can use offline data to say what impact it would have on, you know, like conversion or whatever. Okay? But that's going to be typically error prone. Okay? Uh, but uh, if you can do an A/B test, which is uh, like this then that's a, that's a really good thing you could do if you have the ability to do so. Okay. Um, because in, the, in that case, you can actually attribute a causal relationship between, hey, we introduced feature X, that led to 10% more sales. Okay. So that's the type of uh, kind of claim you can make with the, with the post-processing of the data. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, if you can do this randomized split, then, so, okay, the important point is this random split, and that's what it's doing is basically trying to remove the effect of user's context on the action choice. So basically it's just saying that, hey, whether I show this person A or B has nothing to do with that context. And in that sense, uh, the, therefore the only effect, only thing that should influence the potentially a difference in sales or something else is gonna be the only thing that was different otherwise is just the treatment, whether they, were, they had the feature X or not because the context itself doesn't matter. For example, if it's a student or an elderly person or a professional that has been kind of averaged out because I'm kind of ignoring that by randomly assigning them to either product, you know, baseline system or a system with feature X. So that's important. Um, so we basically collect statistics across two groups, okay? The treatment and control. And then, uh, um, and, and let's say we, we have some true underlying uh, uh, metrics for each, you know, for each version, the existing system and existing, existing system with feature X, okay, or control and treatment. Let's say that it's, it's, I'm just calling it mean effect, like on average, there is some sales or some conversion, some metric associated with uh, one group and some other, and, and some other number associated with some other group, mu1 and mu2. Then basically we just want to check, you know, now it's like back to hypothesis setting. We have data on both sides. And we just want to say, hey, let's say my null hypothesis is that mu1 is equal to mu2. How do I reject that? Okay, so that's basically what you could do. Um, and, and, and there are many approaches. I, I will not go into details of hypothesis testing. I think in 570 or maybe in 572, we might have seen hypothesis testing. But basically, uh, the simplest version is where you kind of really define what H0 is, like the null hypothesis, and try to reject it. Okay. Um, and, and of course, doing testing, so actually even here, how long the A-B test has to run and, uh, uh, you know, and what effect size you're trying to detect and so on. They all, I'm kind of hiding under the, under the rug here. They're all super important for us to figure out how much data you need, first of all. Uh, once you do that, then you can use the data to say reject the null or not reject the null. If you're doing a Fisher type of test, if you're doing Neyman Pearson, you need to talk about the alternative hypothesis and then talk about what is the likelihood of the data under the alternative? What is the likelihood of the data under the null? That's this ratio here null divided by um, alternative. And if, for example, if this, this ratio is really small, that means that likelihood of data under null is like less and the likelihood of data under alternative is high, maybe the alternative is, is the right explanation. Okay, so that's the 
interpretation here. And there's also a Bayesian version where you look at uh, prior probabilities of the each hypothesis that you have. So uh, it's a slightly different ratio. And it's actually these two are same when the prior is the same, that the probability of null is the same as the probability of alternative, then it's the same. Uh, but I just wanted to say that once you have collected data in case two, you can have a collection of uh, methods and not just, you know, this is just at the high level, but the underlying actual test could be the two sample unpaired t test, for example, uh, or it could be uh, something else like a chi square test or you know, other things. Okay, so we'll not go into the detail of the test because that's really the focus is to talk about bandits and something else. So what are the pros, right? The pros is very uh, clear that, you know, it's a very natural thing to think about. Uh, the test is really kind of averaging out the effect of the user context and really saying that, therefore, the only difference between the two groups is because I introduced feature X and therefore feature X can attribute, can be attributed to whatever change that you am observing at the, at the, in terms of sales or whatever conversion metric I'm looking at. Um, so it really uh, decides the worth of a feature. So offline numbers and, you know, all sorts of hypotheses beforehand are fine, but really the field experiment really decides the fate of uh, whether a feature actually performs in the real world or not. And that's because in the real world, especially with humans, you, you don't know how they behave, <laughs> right? Um, so it's quite used, quite a, quite popular in the industry. Um, it's um, uh, compared to, for example, the banded techniques that we'll see uh, in the second, you know, late next, next. But uh, banded techniques have their own advantages and I'm gonna briefly mention that. And, and some companies are offering bandit based approaches as well. And we'll talk about what is the difference. Okay? So A-B testing is also called randomized control trial, also called split testing or bucket testing. Okay. Uh, so just so you don't, you don't see a name and you're not sure what it is, it's the same. Uh, and it not be a one-time one process. You can actually repeat this test again and again and again, if you think something about the situation has changed. Okay. And this is quite common. People's behavior changes as a function of season, as a function of day, uh, you know, um, and things like that. So you should typically test often if possible uh, so that you take the right decisions later on. So once you figure out, what, so from the hypothesis, test, if you figure out uh, action A or action B is better, then in the, then basically, again, it's a very simple loop where you're just basically just taking the same action forever. Okay, so irrespective of the context. So it's really the average effect that we are looking at here. Um, it's not personalized to any particular user. Okay. Uh, that user one should see A or user two should see B. And that will be something that you can do with potentially contextual bandits or even supervised learning, uh, but uh, not with A-B testing. Okay. So what is, so why are we not satisfied with A-B testing? First of all, even if we ignore other techniques, other, other techno, te technique related things, uh, A-B testing can be very easily misused. <laughs> uh, you can actually, there's, you know, you can run an experiment till you see uh, some, you know, that, the, that the, there is some significance for your feature X and then stop the experiment right there, okay? That is uh, basically, you know, peaking, uh, that's what it's called. Uh, or, uh, so therefore, you know, so that's one example. So you need to pre-commit how long you're gonna run, run the test, first of all. Uh, and also, of course, once you run the test and there's no significance, it's not like you can, adaptively extend it till you see a significant, okay? That's another issue. So there are many, many issues uh, in implementation, okay? Um, and generally what people do is they collect the data and then they'll do many, many tests on the same data. If you do many, many tests and you report uh, significance, for example, p-value and so on, you need to correct for it, okay? That, that the fact that you're doing multiple tests means there's, a, there's something called multiple testing correction, okay? That you should be doing. And so there are many uh, statistical issues with just A-B testing, although it's simple to implement. Um, but what we are concerned with is that, you know, let's say we have a thousand users, okay? Uh, that we wanna, so thousand users in this test, uh, uh, overall thousand users. So about 500 users for the, for uh, action A and 500 users for action B. Now the uh, challenge is if I, if, if, if we, it becomes clear from, let's say, like we are doing randomized assignment of first user to something, second user to one of these two actions and so on. If it, if it becomes clear by 50th such randomized action that maybe action A is like way, way better than action B, um, you're kind of wasting time in the sense that you're, you're kind of showing suboptimal things uh, to, the, the, to 500 other people, right? So the, who will come later on. So in the sense that you're not being efficient. So if it's kind of clear that A is better than B, then you should, 
expose A to more, more people. But at the same time, of course, not lose fact that, uh, you know, you still want to estimate a good, have a good handle on uh, whether B is good or not. Okay, so there is this um, static aspect to the A-B testing paradigm where every time a user comes, although you collected feedback, you're not relying on that. You know, let's say for the 400 user for the, uh, or 800 user, it's the same flipping a coin and taking one of the answers. You're not really, um, you know, looking at the data that you've collected so far. And so uh, the idea with multi unbalance is to say, hey, you know, let's actually look at and let's make our decision making dynamic and not just flip a coin, okay? Flip a coin and showing A and B. Instead of that, let's look at our feedback uh, and based on feedback, let's maybe something is more promising than the other. We'll try to pick the more promising one a little bit more higher probability or with a little bit higher, you know, uh, preference than the other one, for example. It's just uh, kind of changing the balance so that you are, you know, at the end of that ex end of that experience, hopefully more users got exposed to the better alternative or better action than than otherwise. Okay, that's the idea. Um, yeah, and and. Uh, and of course, so so this is A-B testing, as I said, is not looking at context, it's average effect. Instead of that, if you care about, uh, you know, user context and then figuring out the personalized, you know, whether they should be exposed to action A or action B, okay, uh, then you'll have to look at something called context design, okay? So, but that's, the, that, that's, this is what you could, you should do for, the, for example, the MSN situation where the user comes, we know from their historical profile, some cookie information or whatever, that they prefer music or they prefer sports, then you should kind of personalize what articles you show based on that information and not just uh, like the globally popular best information. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, like you can basically personalize by using contextual values. And that's why there's a contextual word here compared to um, here. So actually you can say contextual multi on values, but they just short form it to contextual values. Any questions? So I hope this is clear. We're just talking about simple uh, control versus treatment. So it's not really treatment versus treatment stuff. And, and people also do AA testing to just check their infrastructure. So AA test just means, you know, literally have the same thing on both sides. And of course, if you do an AA test, there should not be any difference. And if you're seeing a difference, that means there's some bias that you're introducing uh, the way you set up, the, uh, set up your uh, AB testing infrastructure. Okay, so let's talk about uh, multi on bonnets. So, so what we'll see uh, before we jump, I'll, I'll first introduce the problem and then we'll see a collection of uh, four different um, solution approaches. Okay? Uh, four different only because, you know, they all have their own ways of uh, kind of uh, dealing with this, hey, let's try to give more preference to the promising action while still trying to take care of the other actions which I don't know much about. Okay. So there are four different approaches. And, and so we'll start with the problem definition and then look at the four approaches. And in the assignment, you will uh, implement, I think, at least one or two of them, uh, if I recall correctly. Uh, so it'll be good to, I mean, they, it's easy to implement. They're actually very short functions to implement. Uh, but uh, the objective is to really kind of intuit or informally understand why they make sense. Um, so what is the multi on binary problem? Okay, so it's just a formalization of what we were talking about earlier. Okay, so uh, like in A-B testing, we have two actions, okay? Action A and action B. A priori, we don't know which action is better. So we just try out, you know, so let's say there's like thousand users waiting to maybe go to our website. We'll show website A, website B, or whatever, action one, action two, randomly, okay? And we'll do that for a thousand steps. And then at the end of thousand steps, we'll figure out, we can easily, you know, using hypothesis or something, we can figure out whether action A is better or action B is better. Okay. Um, so multi on uh, problem is kind of mapping that to uh, saying that you taking one of these actions, like action A or action B is like playing a uh, slot machine. Okay. So a bandit is, a, a bandit is just a slot machine. So multi on rest means there are multiple slot machines. Okay, like A and B, two slot machines, or A, B, and C, then the three slot machines. They're just slot machines. And me taking action is like pulling the arm of a bandit, okay, uh, arm of this one of the slot machines. If I pull the arm, then I get some reward, right? So generally, if, if the numbers align or whatever these images align, then I'll get a reward. If the images don't align, then I don't get a reward. Okay? So that's that reward signal is just from, you know, kind of 
stylizing the problem as saying, hey, me taking an action is like saying, I'm pulling the slot machine, uh, sorry, pulling an arm of the slot machine, and then um, I get back some reward. That reward is like a feedback. Okay? Like maybe they clicked something, maybe they did not click something. Okay? So pulling an arm is like making a choice or taking an action. And reward regret, uh, reward is basically uh, whether user clicked or bought an item or something like that. It's a measure of success. Okay? Uh, regret is just, hey, something did not happen. And we'll talk about actually regret in the next slide. But is the at least a naming clear? So multi arm line just means it's just a multi choice uh, situation. Uh, so A B testing also confirms to this, right? So A B testing will be two bandits uh, where A, if you pull a start machine A, I'll get some reward. If you pull a start machine B, I'll get some reward. And uh, and you'll see that this interaction is sequential. So I'll you know every I'll have multiple interactions, and so in each interaction I get to decide: Hey, should I pull uh, pull uh, start machine one or start machine two, or should I take action one or action two? I don't know if there's any comments. Uh, no. Okay, so if you wanna uh, not use the picture, so basically we're gonna use a stochastic uh, description of the problem. Stochastic just means like, uh, stochastic as you know, it just means random randomness. Um, so the description is basically that there are K arms or K actions, capital K actions, like two actions, for example, uh, each correspond to an unknown distribution. Okay, so each action corresponds to an unknown distribution. So there's a distribution tied attached to that action uh, and uh, for simplicity, let's say the distribution is bounded in bounded between zero to one in the sense that the support of the distribution is between zero and one, something like a uniform distribution or a beta distribution or something like that. Okay. And each time the agent, as in our software or algorithm approach, the firm, uh, you know, pulls an arm, like one of takes one of these actions. Okay. So a user comes, we take one of these actions, um, and we observe some reward because we took it, took that action. So we took that action. User liked liked what we showed, or uh, something like that, right? And, and they give a reward and that reward we're just saying it comes from that associated uh, distribution. So the, the whole reason why you're attaching a distribution is that you wanna say how the, how do rewards appear? We're making rewards random variables. Okay? So rewards can be uh, numbers between zero to one, some like um, number, and then we can get the reward if we play that arm, okay? play that action. And the objective is to maximize the expected sum of rewards. Okay? So, we, so, we, so for example, in the thousand run interaction, uh, we'll try some action in the first round, try some other action in the second round, and so on. So we would have tried, let's say, 1,000 actions in 1,000 rounds. 1,000, not different actions, but some of them will be the same. Let's say there are only two actions, then you know you would only have two uh, you know, unique actions, but you would have tried 1,000 you know, uh, uh, rounds. And so you might have tried action one a you know, few number of times, and action two a few number of times. What we want to maximize is the expected sum of rewards, okay? expected sum of rewards. Uh, which means um, uh, which which means that you have you know each each action that you took there's a corresponding reward which is a random variable. So if I took action one in the in some round, then there is a expected reward that I can get for that round. Okay, that's what I, that's what I want to maximize. Okay, in in reality I would have gotten some realization of the random variables, but that's not what I want. What I want to play I want to play actions which in expectation do well. Now, of course, there could be a situation where in expectation action A can be better than B, but it just happens that for one or two users, the realization of random variable reward was such that you know action A seems to be bad. But that doesn't, you know, that's not the we don't care about the um, particular sample. We care about in expectation, we want the better action. We want to figure out the better action and kind of play it. Okay. So the mean of each arm, we're just saying the average of that random variable, let's call it mu k. Uh, and the mean of the best time is just the best of those mu case. So max over k of mu k is just the best of those mu case. Okay? So this notation, uh, the reason I introduced this notation is because we kind of use this to define um, this objective. It was a little bit informal. The objective is to maximize expected sum of rewards. We will kind of formulate in a slightly different way, it's just equivalent, but we'll, we'll have a expression for this, which is as follows. Okay, so bandit, problem is an online problem where we have to come up with a strategy to pick an arm, okay? Pick a action to play in, let's say the eighth round or the hundredth round or the fifth, five hundredth round based on what has transpired before. That part is different from A-B testing. In A-B testing, what we do in the final round is flip a coin and pick one of the actions. What we do in the thousand round is the same, flip a coin, pick an action. But here, 
you can do something clever right so you can look at what previous feedback is and maybe in the previous uh, you know 499 rounds action a seems to be much better than action b then maybe your strategy is hey let's just pick action a okay so you are dependent on the previous stuff okay? so that's what i say we need to come up with some strategy to pick an action okay uh, for example the round robin is round robin strategy i don't know if you in sports you might have seen the like round robin just means pick action so first time person comes pick action a next time another person comes pick action b and next time another person comes go back to action a and then uh, and just like circularly just pick an action or you you pick one action and then keep doing that as, you know throughout uh, but then you don't know what would have been what you could have done you know like how much more reward you got if you have, if you had tried some other action right so that maximizing sum of rewards is the same as uh, minimizing what is called cumulative regret okay so cumulative regret is just a um formalization of the same objective that we saw earlier is just saying okay you you did some action so you got some rewards that is t is equal to 1 to n is the number of rounds so little n is let's say 1000 rounds so out of 1000 rounds every round you got some reward okay so which is x x1 x2 x3 that, those are realizations that are made right these are the rewards you got but if you knew if you knew um the uh, best arm in advance right if, if if you already know the first arm is always the best okay in the in terms of t in terms of the main reward then you'd always do that take that action in every round then the expected reward you would get for that is n times mu star right in every round you're getting mu star the n you know thousand rounds so thousand times mu star is the best you can do what you actually did is collect these rewards okay now what you can do is take an expectation of this term rn okay to take an expectation of each of these xt's you know expectation and so expectation is a linear operation so you can flip summation and expectation so this xt's become whichever mean of the whichever action arm you took okay so that is the uh, cumulative regret that we want to expected cumulative regret that we want to minim minimize okay so we want to minimize the expected cumulative regret the expectation of this term here okay. expectation of uh, these uh, individual random variables as i said it just corresponds to which arm that you pull uh, the the mu's correspond to any question here okay so as i said so it's regret because the best you could have done is this so if, you, if this the points you accumulated or the reward that you accumulated is small then this gap is large so your regret is large hey i could have done in hindsight i could have done something but you know i did uh, these other all these sequences of actions collection of actions they did not fetch fetch me too much uh, reward okay so if this gap is too big then it's bad if the gap is too small then it's really good then you have kind of zoomed in and you are actually doing as good as the best thing in hindsight okay if the if the this with expected cumulative regret is expected cumulative regret is small then you you're doing as good as in hindsight Okay, now let's look at the first uh, approach. Okay, as I said, uh, if you really think of A/B testing as a benchmark, A/B testing is really just doing uh, flipping a coin and taking action every every round. Okay, then it, its regret is going to be pretty terrible, right? So, so if you think of two actions, one of the actions let's say is strictly better than the other, but in every round you're just flipping a coin and uh, taking one action or the other. So, 50% of the time, you took a suboptimal action. Okay, that means your regret is. So, so if it's thousand rounds, five hundred rounds, you did a bad action. If it's ten thousand rounds, five thousand rounds, you did a bad action, and bad action, and so on. So your regret kind of scales with, uh, you know, like it increases as you have more number of rounds. Okay, so it's a it's a bad strategy. Epsilon greedy, on the other hand, is a different strategy which kind of biases yourself towards uh, using the more promising arm, okay? using the more promising arm, uh, more prom promising action. Okay, so what is the idea? the idea is uh, there's a parameter epsilon and so you flip that coin first okay epsilon uh, so you flip a coin with uh, bias epsilon okay so it's like a if it's 50% uh, bias then it's like flipping a unbiased coin but let's say you flip a coin okay so uh, with with this bias epsilon then what you do is uh, so let's say it hands uh, lands tails which means like with 1 minus epsilon probability then you pick the subjectively the best arm okay so at, at time t let's say the 500 round you know that you tried a for let's say 300 rounds and b for 200 rounds based on because you tried a for 200 300 rounds you already know some estimate of how good the performance is right you can take the average of the rewards you get a performance of how good a is similarly you might have done 
B for 200 rounds, so you get a sense of how good B is. Now flip this coin with the bias epsilon. If it lands tails, which means that, you know, uh, if it lands tails, then you say, hey, what is the average score of A and B so far? Okay. Maybe A is better than uh, B, then just pick A. Okay. So that's this, uh, you know, that's just showing, shown by this uh, binary tree type of diagram. It's not binary tree, but, you know, tree type of diagram. So basically exploit the best arm so far with, uh, you know, one minus epsilon probability. Okay. If the initial flip with the epsilon bias falls heads, then what you do is, hey, I, do, I ignore all the previous information. I'll just pick one of these arms at random. So it's basically just doing A-B testing as a subset, you know, it's first flipping a coin to decide whether to do A-B testing or not, basically. Flip a coin with epsilon probability, hey, let's decide to do A-B testing, which is the top part, then pick any of these arms uniformly at random, okay, with one by K probability. But if it lands uh, tails, then I will just look at what's the historically promising arm and just play that. Okay, so is that's that's what it's doing. And it turns out it it does uh, you know I mean in, if you informally think about it, it's basically exploring. Okay, it's exploring a little bit, uh, which is like the scientist point of view, I guess, and then it's exploiting, which is the businessman point of view. Um, so the exploration is what A/B testing is doing. A/B testing is completely exploring. Like it doesn't care about looking at past information at all. So this is like trying to uh, kind of mix those two, okay? Using past information while also exploring. So here is a plot, which is basically trying to show that doing uh, epsilon greedy uh, actually helps, okay? And so the, what this plot is trying to show is that there is some learning happening, okay? So how is that? Uh, to look at that, uh, the situation is actually a five arm um, binary problem. Okay, so there's arm um, one, two, three, four, and five. Their mean rewards are 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and 0 0.9. Okay, in fact, they're Bernoulli arms. So the reward is either zero or one when, when you pick an action, okay? one of these five actions. And the zero or one bias is like 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.9. So it's clear that the fifth arm is the best. Okay, so this, if you knew the true data, if you knew the true performance of each arm, at the a priori, we don't know. So that's what we need to learn. So you can see that, uh, let's, say, let's focus on only one curve here. So this uh, red one. So let's say there's some epsilon is equal to 0.1 for the epsilon greedy approach. Then you can see that at the beginning, uh, you know, beginning few interactions, uh, you have some probability with which you will pick the, the best arm. That probability of you picking the best arm is actually increasing okay? because most often, most often uh, you know, you have an estimate of this, arm that estimate is pretty good that it's not getting confused by these other suboptimal arms. So most of the time, in fact, you can see here, like after 250 rounds, you pretty much are picking uh, the best arm uh, all the time. Okay, so 90, almost 90% 90 of the time. Why 90% of the time and not 100%? Because you have an epsilon which is 10%. You have to kind of exploit, uh, sorry, you have to explore at least 10% of the time. Okay, But remaining 90% of the time, you pretty much are kind of zeroed in on picking the best guy. Okay. So that's the um, performance. Okay, the other ones are just slightly different version. Uh, like epsilon is equal to 0.5 uh, would be, it would also be like, you know, 50% of the time picking the best guy and then remaining almost 50% of the time, a little bit more than 50, but 50% of the time you are picking something at random. Okay. Uh, where would A-B testing be? A-B testing would be like epsilon is equal to one. So you would not be picking, so your probability of selecting the best arm would be like something like, uh, one fifth, which is 20%, something like this, like a flat line here. So you're not picking the best thing um, in every round. So clearly the, these things which are at least doing better than better and better over time, they are the ones which will collect more reward or have less regret. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so as I said, uh, we looked at epsilon greedy and we look at three more algorithms. It's just an exercise. Uh, it's also part of your assignment. So it's, but really what you want to take away from these slides is uh, the intuition. Of it. Like how do we uh, deal with this exploration exploitation? Okay, so where exploitation just means, hey, I have some previous estimates of how good each action is. Should I just go with the better action there based on the previous estimate? Or should I actually try something at random kind of, and then learn a little bit more about uh, these uh, actions that I'm, you know, I need to take. Okay, so that's that's a trade-off. Uh, that uh, that is what is is going on with this this algorithm. It's kind of very transparent. 
Let's look at another algorithm. It's called the upper confidence bound uh, algorithm, UCB, or actually UCB1 is the, te technically that's the name, but uh, let's look at the UCB algorithm, okay? So this, uh, as you saw in the epsilon greedy algorithm, there need to be a source of randomness. The epsilon has to be picked, right? You have to pick a coin. So it's a randomized approach. Here, this uh, algorithm is actually not randomized. Um, it's a little bit deterministic, it's a deterministic approach, uh, but it still uh, gets the job done. So, so the approach is basically, as I said, they have, all these algorithms, all they have to tell me is a prescription. They have to say, hey, at a given time t, you already have collected some data, tell me how to pick, uh, pick, a, pick an action, right? pick, an, pick a decision or make an action, right? So the way this guy, this particular approach does it is the, is the following, right? It selects an arm t based on some scores, okay? Some scores that it maintains for each arm, okay? So this b of k, so ignore the subscript for a second. B of K is just some overall scores that it maintains for each of the K arms. Okay? So some number like, you know, 200, 100, 50, 90, whatever. And then, you know, among them, one of them is the highest and you just play that. Okay? So at least the arm selection is clear once you get the scores. Okay? Now question is, what are these scores? Now scores, uh, if you see, there's a subscript T. T the first subscript just represents... Um, and the fact that we are trying to take a uh, take uh, so this score this is the score at time t okay uh, to be used at time t the first subscript is just that the second subscript is just uh, you know it has a it's related to the arm itself it's just saying how many times have i played that arm in the previous uh, t minus 1 rounds okay so it's just a, some kind of count count it's just saying how many times have i played this particular arm in the previous uh, t minus 1 rounds Okay, so for example, uh, arm A, you might have tried 20 times, arm B, you might have tried 80 times, then uh, T subscript uh, for arm one uh, would be 20, and T subscript arm one, uh, so for arm two would be 80. Okay, so it's just a count. But what are these scores for any any pair of these count and at time T? Time T is kind of important only because it's a constant and it, it's used for the second function here. So the score function, as I said, just depends on two things. Okay, it's just an addition of two numbers. The first number should be clear. The first number is just the, hey, what was the performance of this arm in the past? Okay, so if you tried, if you tried arm one only 20 times, out of those 20 times, how many times did it lead to a sale or a conversion, for example? Okay, that's the, that's the average performance, right? If you tried arm B for 80 times, then out of 80 times, maybe, you know, what is the, what is the how many times did, lead, did arm B lead to conversion? That's the first estimate. In fact, you can see it's just one by S, which is the averaging thing, one by S, some or i is equal to one to s of some rewards that you collect for that arm. Okay, so it's just the collection of average average reward for for that arm. Okay? First term. The first term is clear. So if there was no second term, then this actually strategy is just greedy. So it's just a strategy which is exploiting all the time. It's just saying, hey, I think you have time. What is the average reward of each of my arms? And then pick the one which has the highest average reward and keep playing that. That's greedy. But the problem with greedy approach is uh, it, it, they will not work, right? So you don't know what would have happened if you tried something else. So the second term is balancing that. Okay? So adding the second term is what's creating this, uh, uh, creating a change in this approach where it is, of course, one of, it wants to rely on the most promising arm. Okay? But at the same time, it's saying that, hey, if this arm, if there is some, uh, you know, if there's some, let's say, uh, let's say there's some arm which has which is not promising. Okay, some other score which has less value for the first term. Okay, what will happen is that arm which is which is which has less score, maybe it's not being uh, chosen again and again. Its s value will be low. Okay, so number of times it was cho cho chosen will be low, and t by the way is the, is a round in round index, a round number. It'll it'll go it'll go it'll grow logarithmically. Okay, so two log t. So it's growing and the denominator is not growing. So the second term will blow up. It's like, a, it's basically trying to say, hey, you haven't tried the second thing. Although I know that it's historical performance is low, you should probably start looking at that. Okay? That's what this extra bias is, 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 extra bonus term is doing. And so the overall score is balancing between exploitation uh, related score and then some score which says, hey, you haven't tried it. So this term is gonna blow up. Okay? So occasionally, even if you have a high score, a historical score for one of the arms, maybe some suboptimal arm will have this term, you know, added to it may have a higher overall, uh, you know, overall score, and so it may get picked. Okay. So that's how it's 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 trying to do exploration exploitation a little bit, 
a little bit more involved than uh, Exxon Grady, but um, so that's 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 the idea here. Okay. And uh, here's a slightly different figure. I, I think it's Epsilon Greedy. I showed you a little bit non-standard figure where I was showing the probability of choosing the best arm. Uh, hopefully, you know, of course it has to rise. Here, what you're seeing is a, you know, a different setting where there are 10 actions to take and, uh, you know, a million interactions. So there's a lot of interactions going on here. Uh, so it may not be realistic. In a web scale, maybe sometimes it, it could be realistic, but even there, you know, you don't want to do million interactions. But, uh, and so let's say, let's say for the synthetic data, the reward for each action has a mean of 0.5 divided by K. Okay. So K is let's say five to 15. So basically um, one has a mean reward of 0.1, right? with 0.1 bias, you get a dollar, with 0.9 probability, you will not get a dollar, for example. And the last one is, uh, you know, one, you know one, one by 30, right? So rewards are decreasing, but this is not super important, it's just a ground truth. What we're trying to show is uh, what is the performance of this, this approach, UCB approach. And this is uh, captured by this um, curve here. So this is just one sample path, okay? So this is just RN, if you remember from a few slides ago, RN was just, what is the best thing you could have done, best thing you could have done times N minus, what is the co collection of sum of rewards that you got, okay? So that, you know, that, that RN as a function of N, N is like the number of rounds, is, is this blue curve. So you can see that, it's actually not blowing up. So out of out of the million rounds, the RN value is actually like less than 4,000, for example, okay? So cumulative regret growing less than linearly. So if, if you think of a blue curve, which is blowing up like linearly, anything that does less than linearly is an indication that the algorithm is learning, okay? Algorithm is learning what? It's learning the best arm. Okay? It's learning to play the best arm more and more. Okay, so it's, it's regret is small. And this green curve, I think let's, we, should, we can ignore it, but uh, uh, the theoretical folks have figured out what is the, what is an upper bound on, on the expected performance. Okay, so it's an expected performance. So this is a particular sample path. It could, this thing could be above or below, but in expectation, it'll, it, they're saying that they should not, it'll depend on K and uh, K linearly, and it'll depend on N number of rounds logarithmically. Okay, but this is a theoretical result. I just wanted to plot that extra thing, but, what the important thing is, we'll regret will be small. Okay. So, any questions here? Okay. So, let's look at the next approach, um, which is called Thompson sampling. Okay. So, this is a uh, so UCB did not need a, an external source of like randomness. Thompson sampling is a Bayesian approach, so it it will try to maintain distributions and. It will try to use base rule to update uh, to distributions called posterior distributions and so on. Okay. The really old algorithm, 1933, it's 2022. So basically 89 years ago, right? Um, so, or sorry, um, how many years ago? Yeah, 89 years ago. Um, so, so what is the strategy, right? So again, the problem is the same. A priori, we don't know which arm is the better, better one. Every round we need to pick an arm, okay? and eventually hope, hoping that at the end of let's say some number of rounds we kind of pick the better arm uh, most of the time. Okay, so what we'll do is let's still stick, stick to this Bernoulli reward. So every time we pick an arm, either we get a uh, with with some bias we'll get a zero dollar reward or a one dollar reward. Okay, so the rewards are always zero or one dollars, but it's just a, how frequently can we get one dollar is the is the is the unknown parameter. So instead of instead of this frequentist view, what we'll think of is that there is a distribution over the parameters, okay? Distribution over the parameters. So in the frequency view, there's a fixed unknown bias of each arm. So remember each arm is associated with the distribution. The distribution will have a mean value, right? So that's, that mean value is fixed unknown, okay? So pre previously. Now that mean value itself is a uh, random variable, okay? And in the Bayesian view, the mean value itself is a random variable, who so therefore it will have a distribution. The initial distribution is going to be uniform. So what's going to happen? So what is base rule doing is going to be that initially we'll have a uniform distribution over that mean value. And as the time, as we interact with, uh, try out different arms, we're going to go from uniform distribution to some concentrated distribution, which will be hopefully be like, um, you know, which will kind of differentiate between one arm versus the other, because one arm can have a distribution, which is 
uh, you know, which will be like a normal distribution or whatever, peaky distribution with uh, close, to the, close to the underlying truth, whereas some other uh, arm will have its own distribution close to the underlying truth. Okay? So start with a uniform prior on the parameters. Okay? Uh, Uniform prior on the parameters. So, the, so the, it's a base in perspective for the algorithm. The ground, the setting itself could be, could be exactly as before. So, which is that there's a fixed unknown parameter mu, but the algorithm is thinking, hey, I don't know anything about the parameters. Let me think of a uniform distribution first on on the parameter uh, on the parameter, and then I'm going to update this this distribution. Okay. So, given this uniform distribution, in fact. Let's call it, you know, although it's uniform prior, uh, any given point of time, let's say the distribution for each, each of these mu i's is called pi i of t. i is for the ith arm, t is the teeth round, and pi i is the distribution over each arm, okay? Each arm's mean value, okay? So we have pi i of t. So what are we gonna do? The algorithm is very simple. The moment you have a distribution of what you believe is gonna be the mean reward for each arm, then you can just sample from e these distributions. Okay, so that's theta it. So you get a sample from uh, the distribution of the first arm, uh, sample from distribution from the second arm, and, and so on. So remember, these are not distributions of the reward. These are just my internal things of, hey, what I think could be a reward for each of these arms. Okay. So you get theta t. Then the algorithm is, hey, we got all these sample numbers. Let's just take the maximum value, index of the maximum, and just play that arm. Okay. So that's the idea here. The idea is, maintain a distribution over each arm of what you think the mean reward could be. Okay. In extreme case, ideally mean rewards of single numbers, so there should be a distribution that's like a point distribution, but we don't know. A priori, we're gonna start with a uniform distribution. And hopefully by getting data, we're gonna update these distributions to posterior distribution. And then again, any given point of time, if you wanna take, take a decision, we'll just sample from the current distributions, okay, pi i's. And then uh, once you get the samples, take the index of the maximum. Okay, that's, uh, that's the argument. So here, uh, there is a exploration exploitation happening implicitly. Okay, why is that? Um, yeah. So there's an exploration, an exploration happening implicitly, and why is that? Is because think of this, right? So pi i of t. Okay. So so t is not super important. Let's say we are round t. So pi i for some arm which is not explored much. Remember, it's, it started with a uniform distribution. If you have not tried out that arm much, it's kind of gonna have a high variance in the sense that it'll still be like flat, flattish, okay? If you've tried out an arm quite a few many times, it'll, be, it'll have a huge peak, uh, maybe at the true value, okay? So, and, and, and if you remember, we sample parameters from this distribution. So the one which is not tried much, it can have more, you know, higher probability of extreme values. And so that the one which is not tried much may become the arm max, uh, here and so maybe the one which we get tried today. Okay. So that's how uh, ha that's how uh, there's a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Um, okay, so let's actually uh, any questions? I I'm trying to think if this is useful to discuss conjugate priors. I think I'll skip conjugate priors. Um, discussion. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll skip the conjugate prior discussion only because it's a technical detail. The important thing is why would this work? Why is it trading off exploration and exploitation? Okay. So uh, let me skip conjugate priors. Um, yeah, actually that means much of our discussion is just this slide. Uh, so is, is the idea clear? Any questions uh, with this? It's basically maintain a distribution for each arm, initially uniform. And let's say I try try action one, okay? I, I, I get a dollar reward. Because of the Bernoulli observation, uh, which we assume uh, as well, on the prior, we can use the prior times likelihood to get, uh, get a posterior distribution of, of, the, of this arm. Okay? That posterior distribution is called pi. It's just an update on the distribution. Initially, you thought the mean reward is, could be anything between zero to one, but now you got a dollar. So you kind of now have to get a newer distribution, which is posterior distribution. It's called posterior distribution, which will be slightly biased towards, hey, maybe the mean reward is not zero, but away from zero because you got a dollar, right? And maybe next time again, you try the same arm, maybe you again got a dollar. Then you know that the distribution has to be kind of maybe away, much more away from zero. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the distribution here, pi i that you're changing. So every round, 
you're just updating one of these distributions because you tried one of these actions. And once you do that, uh, because of feedback, and then at any given point of time, if you want to make a decision, sample from them and then pick the, pick the maximum. So this is a heuristic. I mean, the analysis of why this makes sense, technically um, researchers have done it uh, for the simplest, simplest cases, um, but, uh, but, but it works, okay? In fact, sometimes it works better than the previous algorithm. Although both approaches have the same, uh, I guess, worst case upper bounds, okay? So um, same uh, type of worst case results. Okay, so what we'll do now is actually take a break for uh, 10 minutes and then uh, resume. Okay, so we'll look at the remaining algorithm is just called exp3 and then uh, we'll look at contextual bandits. Okay. I think I'm too far ahead. Um, so, so what have we done so far before the break, right? So let me just, uh, you know, again, you know, this is a new topic and I think it's a good time to again, refresh why it's different from supervised learning um, and why that, that makes sense. So what we did at the beginning is talk about online machine learning and show that for loop. So you are taking actions, so basically labels, you can think of them as labels, except the feedback you're getting is whether your label is correct or not, and you don't know whether, what the true label is. Okay? It's called banded feedback, in fact. The, the, when your feedback involves, hey, this is not the right answer, but here's the right answer, which is the one you typically get in supervised learning, that's called full information feedback. So it's full information versus banded feedback. So that's the difference between uh, these two paradigms. Uh, full information would be essentially supervised learning. So you can literally just do, batch training every time you know every time or even after like 100, 100 rounds or something you can keep uh, you can do supervised learning and you'll be fine but the moment you have um banded, banded feedback you cannot just uh, um you cannot just do supervised learning okay? and we'll see that when we get to contextual bandits in a in a in a few slides but uh, again to just recap we looked at online machine learning there is some difference in supervised learning uh, we have we have context and actions from which we want to say, uh, for example, given a context, we want to predict action, or we can also do something else, which is given context and action, predict the reward so that you can say, hey, and then keep changing the action to say, figure out which reward is the highest. And so you can take that action. So there are many ways to formulate it as a supervised learning problem. Um, actually, this is not the right slide. Don't worry about the slide, but um, so look at online. So we discuss online machine learning through the msn.com example. And then we briefly discuss A-B testing where we can, uh, where we need to decide. So this online machine learning, we dropped the context part and then said, hey, even if you want to just take an action, so population level, uh, which action is better, we don't know. And we want to take, figure out which one is better. That's what AV testing will give you. It will give you a, an estimate of the average treatment effect. Okay. Um, and, uh, but, so that's good. And there's some pros and cons of AV testing. One of the big cons of AV testing is that you are a little bit inefficient, sample inefficient, which is that if A and B are two actions in, in which you, and so you, in each round, you're basically flipping a coin and taking one of these actions. You're not relying on previous feedback that you've gotten. So in the 500th interaction with the user, you're still flipping a coin and taking one of the actions. Instead of that, can you just take, take into account what happened before? And which is called basically dynamic, uh, I guess, uh, decision making, right? You're, you're being uh, kind of, you're, 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 sorry, you're being adaptive to what happened before, okay? Whereas the vanilla IV testing is just ignore what happened before. Maybe B, uh, action B is terrible. Still, you're like flipping a coin and showing action B to some other users. That's, that was one of the cons. Then what we did is uh, talk about the multi arm bandit, uh, you know, uh, problem context. You know, multi arm bandit just means there are multiple choices or multiple actions to take. And each action is basically associated with a, essentially a slot machine or a bandit. And, and, and uh, when you, every time you take an action, there is a stochastic reward that you can get. Okay? Stochastic reward just means take an action, there's an underlying distribution from which you get, get a reward. Okay? So for example, think of Bernoulli distribution with some bias, unknown bias. Then if you, every time you take that action, you get either $0 or $1, let's say, but with some unknown uh, probability. 
okay, the bias. Okay, and of course you want to pick that action which has the higher bias. Okay, the higher like the mean reward is 0.9 for a Bernoulli distribution. That means most of the times I'll see head, or most of the times I'll be see a dollar. Right. So that's the uh, trade-off we want to figure out. Okay, so that's the um, uh, so basically by doing trying out different actions, we want to figure out hey, I want to pick that arm which has 0.9 reward or 0.9 mean reward, and so I get more dollars. Okay, that's what we want to do. And uh, and so in that sense, if you just do A/B testing style, like trying each action uniformly at random, then uh, if let's say we have five actions, then uh, if one of the arms is the better one, which gives you let's say dollar all the time, but the other actions give you dollar only half the time or something, then you are actually losing. You're only doing well 20% of the time. If there are five five arms, you know, remaining 80% of the time you're just picking the suboptimal thing, and so you're losing money. Okay. So that's the trade-off that that uh, is is being made by clever approaches, which is not being made by an explore-only approach like A/B testing. Okay. A/B testing would be explore-only approach. And so the first algorithm we saw was epsilon greedy, which is uh, basically a, you know trying to add an exploitation angle, saying that hey, with some probability, let me just look at the historical best arm and just play that. And with some other probability, just me, let me basically do A/B testing. Okay, so that was explore exploit for um, uh, epsilon greedy, and we saw a performance curve. It also has its own uh, theoretical results, but we are not going to get into the, those sorts of results here. The second algorithm we saw is something called UCB algorithm. Actually, let me just go to that slide. Um, the UCB algorithm doesn't need a source of randomness, but what it's doing is maintaining a score for each arm at any given round. And the score just depends on historical performance, like some average limits. Let's say if I tried a particular arm 20 times, and I got $18 as a result, and this new hat is like 18 by 20, like average reward per, per try. Um, and if I tried something else 80 times and I got a reward of $60, then a 60 by uh, 80 is like the dollar per, per try. But then I also made an extra term, and the term grows as a function of uh, interaction index, okay, interaction round. So if I'm interacting for the 100th time, it is log 100. If I'm interacting for the 500th time with any user, then it's like log 500. So just the numerator is growing. A denominator, if it's fixed, if I don't try some of the arms, then the second term blows up. Okay. And so uh, arms which are not selected, if you remember, I'm going to select arms based on this index. And so maybe one arm has a really promising, very high average reward. I keep playing that. That means that the other arms which have lesser average reward, they may never be played. Okay. And, and so the whole point of the second term is saying that, hey, if this, if S is small, then the second term will as a smaller fixed okay as the time index in, increases then the second term will will grow because relative to uh, you know the better performing arm and so then maybe i'll, I'll choose the suboptimal arm okay so it's, that's how it's trading off between exploration and exploitation um so and, and so ucb we saw again the cumulative re, uh, reward sorry cumulative regret is sublinear okay so anything which is growing uh, below l 45 degree line is called sublinear Anything which is growing above 40 degree lines so like a super linear. You might have heard the sublinear term and if you've done complexity analysis of algorithms, like, hey, this is a linear time algorithm or this is a quadratic time algorithm. So sublinear just means something which grows uh, not you know, linearly, but linearly would be something like a diagonal line. Okay? Uh, instead of that, it's going below the diagonal line. So it's called a sublinear growth of this regret. Okay? And so we can see sublinear growth with the UCB and it has its own performance results that uh, theory folks have given, but we don't care about uh, that, at least for this case, initial discussion, okay? Um, and the next algorithm we saw right before the break is called Thompson sampling. Uh, uh, it's a pretty old approach. Actually, this is what uh, kind of was related to clinical trials uh, uh, where, you know, you can do clinical trials using A-B testing or you can do clinical trials using Thompson sampling um, so that you can give the better, better, drug or the better uh, treatment to more people uh, you know by uh, by the end of the number of interactions right so the idea is to you know the problem setting is the same still the same uh, each uh, arm has a distribution a mean reward and so on but you as an algorithm a priori don't know which arm is the better one you maintain uniform distributions at the beginning on each of these uh, mean rewards because you don't know what the mean rewards are and then every time you try an action you get a banali reward and based on that observation this uniform distribution kind of changes to a posterior distribution. Okay, so uniform distribution is, by the way, an extreme case of uh, a beta distribution. Okay, so beta one comma one is the uniform distribution. Okay, so you can check up on Wikipedia what is the beta distribution, what is the uniform distribution uh, on the on on between zero to one, 
So you start with the beta one comma one distribution, you get an you get a Bernoulli observation, and after that you get a posterior distribution. It turns out that if you have a Bernoulli likelihood and a beta prior, then your posterior is also beta distributed. Okay, and so that's the conjugacy idea. But we will kind of skip over conjugacy. The idea is that you make observation, you go from a distribution before to a distribution after. That's that update is by a base rule. Okay, and that's why it's a base in Ampon, and that distribution is called pi i. So I just indexes arms. Okay, so if you have two arms, there will be pi one, pi one, pi two. If there are five arms, pi one, pi two, pi three, pi four, pi five. So these are distributions. Think of the uh, distributions between zero to one because we said, you know, Bernoulli rewards, and so the bias will be between zero to one. And uh, and so how do we take actions? Okay, we are maintaining distributions. How do we take actions? The action choice is by just sampling from these, let's say, two distributions or five distributions, sampling numbers, and just sorting those numbers and figuring out which. Uh, Uh, which arm gave the highest uh, sample? Okay, so that's what. So it's just produce five numbers or produce two numbers and pick the arm with the highest number. Okay. This seems very you know uh, messy, right? You're making a distribution. There is some sampling going on, randomness going on, and then you're taking an action. But it turns out that this way of choosing uh, um, actions uh, kind of trades off exploration, exploitation, very similar to how epsilon greedy and UCB do, and still gets us uh, a Good handle on you know ex exploiting the one which is promising while still being able to explore the ones which are which you have less information about. Okay, so that's the um, idea of Thomson sampling. Uh, the next few slides we're covering the idea of conjugacy, which I where I said if you have a if you want to implement Bayes rule, you know you have to have a prior a likelihood and then a posterior distribution formula. Uh, that formula becomes easy if uh, there is something called conjugacy. Okay, so Bernoulli distribution is a conjugate prior to what is called a sorry. But now beta distribution is a conjugate prior to Bernoulli. Okay, um, what does that mean? It just means that if you have a beta prior and a Bernoulli likelihood, then the posterior is also beta distributed. Okay, so so in that sense, you don't have to do some integration or any complicated computation. It just makes the this update okay pi i of t to pi of t of t plus one easy. So the next time you need to have main, next time you want to update the distribution, it's kind of super easy, computationally easy. Uh, but that's why, so since it's a computational detail, we're gonna skip um, uh, this conjugacy discussion. Okay, for the next next uh, three or four slides. Uh, so that's where we were before the break. Okay. Um, yeah. So now what we're going to do is uh, uh, in the remaining time of this lecture, we're going to look at two algorithms. Okay. And and there's a reason why I'm introducing so two algorithms. One is still related to UCB, so it's in fact uh, uh, still related. Sorry, uh, still related to multi-arm bandits uh, called EXP3, and then we'll look at the contextual bandit setting. Remember, our, we contextual bandit setting is the one which is the closest to supervised learning. So we'll talk about the differences in supervised learning later uh, when we get to contextual bandits. But that algorithm, uh, it's easy to motivate if you see the current algorithm, and that's why we are looking at the current algorithm, which, which is not related to contextual bandits. It's still multi-arm bandit uh, setting. Okay. But what is the uh, new thing about this algorithm? Is it does exploration exploitation in a sli slightly different way? Exploration exploitation in a slightly different way, uh, which is that in fact it works in a more challenging uh, setting in the sense that uh, a, a setting with lesser assumptions, and that lesser assumptions is the non-probabilistic setting. Okay. So what is mean, what do I mean by non-probabilistic setting? Remember when when I motivated the multi-arm bandit problem, I said each arm comes with a distribution. Distribution over the rewards, okay, the Bernoulli distribution, which kind of gives me zero dollars or one dollars with some bias, right? So instead of the distribution, we kind of we say, hey, there's no such distribution, okay? So why is that? I mean, so we, we're going to drop that, and then then becomes, hey, how do we even kind of design an algorithm, and how does how do you know it works, right? So there, so people have figured out an approach, which we'll see in the next slide. But the reason why we don't want such uh, um, rewards, by the way, rewards are also IID before because If I plan, if I try uh, action A, I get some reward. Next time I play action A, I get some reward. Those two reward random reward realizations have nothing to do with each other. If one one lands heads, the other ones can potentially land tails. Okay, there's nothing, no relation. Uh, here, the reason why we want to do non-probabilistic is, of course, we we can be we the lesser assumptions we make, the more robust uh, a, a learning approach could be. Right. So uh, these rewards may be output of a com complex process. Then. Um, then it, it still works. If these rewards can be generated by an adversary, in the sense that just just like the generative adver generative adversarial network type of adversary, so it, it could be a game where I play an arm, 
you give me a reward okay and where you are trying to kind of give me less reward if possible and i'm trying to collect more reward as, as much as possible remember i'm trying to minimize cumulative reg regret or maximize total reward so you can have a second player who is trying to give me reward uh, but uh, is trying to ensure that i don't collect too much reward okay? even that is possible in this in this uh, discussion okay of course there you know there has to be some limitation the adversary cannot just say every time you pick an army they can say hey reward zero that will be too too powerful so there is some uh, treatment uh, appropriate uh, limitation in adversary that we have to put but you know we'll not get into that details um, we directly want to get to an algorithmic approach um so so basically we're dropping the probability reward, uh, reward assumptions and so uh, actually let's let me briefly mention what the uh, what the mechanism is going to be so there is no stochasticity so the way you think about uh, how we get a reward for each arm is every round the adversary has to do take the first action which is hey i'll set reward of something $1 for this arm to $0 for this arm $1 for this arm and so on so first adversary chooses some numbers for each of the k arms okay then the player selects an arm okay and then uh, we are in the last setting in the banded information setting so we only see the reward for the arm that we take okay the full information setting i think i briefly mentioned it before full information setting is you say a label or an action and it also tells you what you what would have happened if you did something else okay uh think of like these rewards like a loss value so misclassification loss then the misclassification loss will be zero for the true uh label and and kind of one for every other label right uh in full information case you are, you kind of see the misclassification loss for you know you say cat but if you the truth the ground truth is a dog you also know that if you said dog the error is zero okay that's what full information is and so this itself is number one distinction from supervised learning okay? so we are actually getting only information of what we did okay um so yeah so now let's talk about the algorithm okay the algorithm again is is intuitive actually it's more intuitive than the uh, thomson sampling approach so um the algorithm has actually uh, just maintains some numbers again very similar to ucb uh, uh, algorithm maintains some scores some numbers on each of the k arms okay so if there are two arms so we will maintain two numbers okay uh w k okay w of 1 and w of 2 okay two two numbers or if the number of arms is 5 then we will maintain five numbers okay so w1 so the subscript one just represents uh, the round index so start at the beginning first round we will start with the w1 as a uh, one uh, one for everybody and then in the second round third round fourth round w2 w3 w4 we going to change these numbers okay and it's kind of uh, intuitive right so we maintaining basically these numbers and the point is that we're going to uh, increase the numbers for the ones which we find promising and decrease the numbers which we find uh, which are not promising okay uh, so you can imagine that these numbers somehow you know uh, kind of are proportional to how promising any action is okay and then to make an action uh, to take an action in a given round you can imagine hey i have a bunch of numbers they're all positive by the way uh, we'll keep them positive what we can do is very sim very simply normalize them then we'll get a probability mass probability mass function right so if i if i have numbers like 10 20 30 40 50 then i can just uh, divide by the sum of uh, 10 20 30 40 50 then uh, i can get a probability mass function like 50 divided by uh, some total uh, 40 divided by some total and so on so these are proportions now you have a distribution now you can just sample from the distribution okay so to take an action if you can maintain these positive weights you can normalize them and take an action based on the probability mass function that's it that's that's algorithm is that algorithm is called exp3 okay uh, why exp3 is just a legacy i mean there were some other variations uh, that were also proposed so um, um, so that's why this algorithm is called exp3 uh, so here's the uh, same what i just said in in a more uh, formal way so at each time okay so t is uh, 1 to n number of rounds uh, the player selects an arm i according to a distribution okay. so what is this distribution as i said uh, let's ignore the second term here the distribution uh, at time t so uh, at time t for a arm k is just w divided by the total w okay so at time t i'll have a bunch of w values right for each of the arms so i'm just saying hey i'm gonna, i'm going to pick uh, at time t this arm k with proportional to the uh, weight uh, proportional to the score that i've given to the sum 
related to others. It's just a normalized PMF. Okay. That has an extra one minus gamma and gamma plus k exactly because it's this one minus gamma and gamma plus a k, gamma by k are exactly the same idea from the epsilon greedy approach. It's just saying, hey, with one minus gamma, I'm going to take this weight or with uh, gamma probability, I'm going to take, uh, you know, uniformly at random. Okay, that's, so we're just saying, we're going to use weights with a very high, you know, with high mass, uh, so with some proportion, or we can take this, this arm k with gamma by k mass as well. So this gamma is just a way to ensure that uh, all arms have at least some non-zero probability. So for example, if W is, you know, not zero, but some small number, uh, kind of going smaller and smaller, then at least you'll say, hey, I mean, even if this whole thing goes, you know, really becomes really small, gamma by k is the at least the minimum probability with which I'll pick each arm. Okay, so that's just ensuring that you will explore the uh, this extra term here. But if you ignore the gamma and one minus gamma, it's just saying, hey, any given point of time, I'm maintaining these scores, just normalize them, and whichever if if some arm is has a higher score, it's more promising. Let's play that more. Okay, that's the idea. And how do we do a feedback? Let's say we played arm arm uh, arm uh, k, okay. If we played arm k, then uh, we're gonna get a reward x x uh, s of k. S is just the s time we played this this particular arm. So uh, we get some some reward x of x of k, maybe a dollar, maybe zero, whatever it is. Then what we're gonna do is the way we're gonna account uh, for uh, uh, updating w. So remember we have to just update w. Right, uh, we've got a particular reward, and so we have to now update Ws. So the way we're going to update is uh, we're going to now synthetically create a reward for each of the arms. Okay, so of course we only played one arm, so that arm got some reward. How can I update the reward for the other arms? The answer is uh, you're going to use this formula where excess of k is the reward that you got for the kth arm divided by the probability of playing that arm. Okay, so if I, if I play the kth arm, there'll be some probability that I, I, would, I would have play, played that arm. That's a divided by probability. And this indicator is just saying indicator whether your current chosen arm is the kth arm or not. So basically I got one reward for the first arm, let's say. And I played with the, I played that arm with probability 50%, okay, 0.5. Then my reward, so and the reward let's say is $1. Then the transform reward extra x tilde is going to be one dollar divided by 0.5, which is actually going to be two two units. Okay, for the other arms that were not played, okay, this indicator will ensure that the other arms will have a number zero. So it's basically from one from binary information, which is uh, I only get I only got a dollar one because uh, I, I only got a dollar because I played the first arm has been has been changed to a reward for all the arms where the other arms rewards are zero. And the first arm's reward is one dollar divided by the probability with which I played. So there's some correct, some you know, basically transformation going on. Once you do that, x tilde, then you can update each of the weights according to this formula. Uh, this is the cumulative formula, so it looks very messy. But what's going on is just what is the previous weight value times e to the power eta times x tilde. It's just a you can see that it's e to the power some summation. So that's like e, e to the power a times e to the power b times e to the power c, like uh, several terms like that. So, so the cumulatively, you're just adding that x tilde, whatever you got here, uh, as an extra term here. And eta is a parameter, gamma is a parameter, and so on. Any questions about this uh, algorithm definition? Again, the intuition is just maintain weights. The weights are going to be higher if you get more reward for that arm when you play it. And if the weights are higher, you'll more likely to take that down, more likely to play that down in the next rounds. There's an extra buffer and to ensure that there are some arms which you may not uh, play. And so their weights will be maybe small. You still want to ensure that they get played at some point, you know, with some probability. And so that's why you're getting adding an extra uh, constant parameter, co constant value there. Yeah. And there's some correction going on. And that's, that's ex actually there's some detail there, which I'm going to skip. That correction is necessary to ensure that the Estimated loss is um, 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 estimated loss is, uh, is basically unbiased, and so it can be used to uh, get the weights uh, in this manner. And, and this algorithm therefore uh, achieves some good performance. Okay, and again, on in the theory side, people have figured out that this algorithm can do well even in the non non stochastic setting. Um, yeah, and you can see the performance here. Again, simulated sitting. So 10 actions, 
a thousand interactions and uh, reward for each action is is bernoulli so although we said it's a non probabilistic you know, algorithm doesn't make an assumption you can always use that algorithm in a setting where it is actually uh, bernoulli reward for each arm okay and then you can see here is the performance so regret is actually again sublinear whereas the uh, worst case regret i think uh, is is being shown here uh, it's uh, it's 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 not it's not linear but it's basically Uh, square root n okay so it's kind of zoomed in so that's why it looks like line but it's basically square root n is the worst case but you can see that it's actually doing better in this in this sample path um and you can see again if you go back to epsilon greedy there was this what is the probability of picking the right arm uh, best arm so here is the same thing weights are kind of proportional to the probability of picking that arm so you can see that the weight of one of these arms is kind of almost reaching one and weights of all the other arms are going to zero although the weights are going to zero the probability of picking any one of these arms is lower bounded by gamma by k okay so it's it's like they are not zero in the sense that you will still be able to pick those arms but they are not uh, promising okay. so the algorithm works so these are just diagnostic views to say that uh, the algorithm is learning learning to pick the right uh, choice right arm so any questions here okay so let's uh, um we'll go over to uh, the next topic as i said uh, if you really zoom back in i'm not going to review again but <laughs> zoom back out uh, the idea is to connect to reinforcement learning okay i'm going to make the connection towards the end but really to appreciate reinforcement learning you want to take baby steps first is ab testing which was um which doesn't exactly fit into banish but it's a good idea to understand how we are trying to figure out how we are trying to figure out figure uh, out uh, making the best decisions how to make best decisions sorry um and then we did multi arm banish uh so far I and mean, we saw several algorithms uh, epsilon greedy ucb1 thomson sampling exp3 um and now next we are going to look at a contextual banish setting okay all this is just a precursor to kind of uh, motivate reinforcement learning okay which is a very interesting topic i think at the beginning i showed you it's one of the breakthrough technologies in one of the magazines back in the day uh, five years ago uh, have have had several successes in uh, in, uh, in in some domains um so that's the overall context we are really just made, paving the path for next lecture which is about reinforcement learning and for that we want to cover these baby or uh, it's a warm up problems okay warm up settings uh, so and the setting that we want to kind of uh, kind of bridge the gap on now is related to supervised learning i've been saying hey supervised learning is different from online learning uh in terms of the bandwidth feedback certainly i've been I've, i've mentioned it a couple of times but uh if you remember if you just saw for multi arm bandwidth and ab testing there was no use of context okay? ab testing was just average treatment effect so it's not really it doesn't matter whether whether the user is you know users have some different features right similarly multi arm bandwidth it was just um each arm uh, had an uh, had an average performance average reward and we were just trying to figure out which arm has the highest reward okay in a sample efficient way or or trying to minimize cumulative regret so there was no context information so every interaction we kind of ignoring context and just trying out one or the other okay now context or features okay context of features is kind of interchangeable uh, the question is how do we uh, work with context okay so for that let's go back to our msn example the user is coming with a context this context of feature vector or whatever you want to call it user comes with a context Microsoft chooses something, okay, some action. Okay, that action seems complicated here because it's a bunch of articles to show, and then user responds with, uh, you know, some engagement, and that engagement is the feedback for the action that that Microsoft chose. Okay, so instead of getting a dollar reward that we've been talking about, it's it's some response like you know, uh, X minutes on the website or something like that. Um, and the goal again is to maximize this feedback, and generally, you know, you know, feedback is generally like either max, you know, if let's say the feedback is minutes then you want to maximize let's say you want to maximize the number of minutes spent so that's the type of uh, objective so it's basically trying to maximize the desired user behavior if that's captured in the reward okay or in the, captured in the feedback and the assumption uh, is still going to be that is going to be the iid type of assumption where a context comes you do something they get you they give you some reward uh, which is hey it's a good uh, response to what i wanted or maybe not a good action to what i wanted it has nothing to do with the next context who's coming and for whom we are trying to show take an action okay so it's very similar to the iid assumption in supervised learning where 
if we do a misclassification for one row, it has nothing to do with, you know, uh, you know, the second row's uh, misclassification okay? in the test set, for example, right? So similarly here, uh, what we do for one context has nothing to do with uh, another context. Okay, that's a restrictive assumption. You can imagine the same user coming every day. And so the first time the user comes, they see something, you know, maybe not, not the best articles and they don't like it. Next time they come, they already have predetermined kind of that this is not good. And so there is, there could be some uh, kind of uh, non iid ness okay? Which is basically called state uh, uh, across time, which is, uh, which could be there in, in realistic situations, but we are not, uh, we are kind of dropping that, okay? That's, that's something being made. Okay, so clearly previous bandit uh, models or previous bandit uh, modeling approaches, algorithms are not enough because there's no context, right? Uh, but, um, also the good thing is that we, there's no carryover effect from one interaction to the, uh, one interaction to the next, okay? If, but as I said, if there is gonna be some, uh, inter, uh, you know, carryover effect, like the first time I show something, uh, may anchor them to that price or whatever it is. So if there's gonna be carryover effect, then you have to use something more sophisticated that will be reinforcement learning, okay? We'll talk about it next lecture. Um, so now let's come back to the contextual bandit setting. The setting is as uh, follows. Uh, uh, every round we get a context. We want to find every round we get a context and we take actions, right? Uh, and we get feedback. So the usual online learning group, but the learning part, which you know, the learning part is basically we want to find a policy. Okay, now we change the uh, we change our objective. We don't want to find the best action, like in A/B testing or in multi analysis. What we want to find is the best policy. What is the policy? It's just a function. So whether I use the word policy or function is the same. So instead of trying to learn and learn the best action, so single label, you know, which doesn't make sense to supervise learning, it's like saying, hey, which class label is the most prevalent? Just use that label, for example, right? It doesn't make sense. So we want to find a, the best uh, best function or policy. Okay. Uh, so what does the function do? The function's uh, signature is as follows, right? It function takes the context as an input, produces an action as an output. So so we really are basically trying to figure out not the best action, but the best policy. So instead of, instead of thinking of optimizing over actions, we are optimizing over functions now. So it's now closer to supervised learning, right? Um, and uh, of course the important thing is the same context may not appear twice. So there has to be some generalization, right? So the, the same feature vector will not come again and again. The same feature vector is coming every day, like for a hundred times, then, you know, for the, that context, you can figure out, you can do A-B testing basically, for example but we will not get the same context. So we really have to uh, have generalizable functions and uh, figure out the best function, okay? Um, and of course, uh, just to recap, the difference from uh, MAB setting or multi arm manual setting is that there's no context in the multi arm manual setting. And we're just finding a single best action. Here we are finding a function itself, which produces an action in different contexts. Um, so uh, we'll look at actually very, so contextual bandit algorithms, first of all, are their own beast and they're non-trivial, okay? Unlike in supervised learning, you can start with linear regression or something else and, and have prototypical algorithms. We will see one algorithm today, uh, which has its own pros and cons, but we will not be able to get into the details of all sorts of contextual bandit approaches, okay? And, and uh, there are some maybe links on the course page that you can uh, pursue afterwards. But what I wanna spend the next five minutes on is just to kind of uh, show you why, why there's some benefit of context, okay? Um, and that's through an example. So let's say we have a few ads, okay? So we, let's say we, we have five ads, okay? Ads are the actions that we wanna take, okay? So add A1, A2, A3, A4, A5 uh, are these ads, like the, let's say they are text ads. And uh, let's say we have, so these five ads are the actions, okay? But we're not optimizing on actions, okay? What we wanna optimize on is functions. Let's say we have four functions, okay? And why do we have four and not 40? Let's simply, this is an illustration. Let's say we have four functions, okay? What do these functions do? Given any feature vector, they produce one of these five actions, okay? So the output space, uh, output of these functions is one of these five actions, depending on the context, okay? So think of them as like, uh, yeah, just like functions, right? So now let's look at uh, one round of exp3, okay? So, you know, I'm trying to motivate towards an, an algorithm for contextual bandit. Now, exp3 is not a contextual bandit algorithm. Uh, it's a multi-armed algorithm. We just saw that a couple of slides ago. 
what we're going to do is that for exp3 you know remember exp3 was maintaining weights on actions right uh, weights on actions instead of maintaining weights on actions what we're going to do is maintain weights on the functions okay and we, we happen to have four functions then we we'll, therefore will maintain four weights if we had 40 functions we would just maintain 40 weights okay so we're just trying to see if we can reuse exp3 uh, at the function level rather than at the action level okay uh, to illustrate how context can uh, be uh, can can help us uh, right so how context can, can be utilized sorry so um, so here's the idea so in each round uh, say you know in a, in a particular round t uh, say the the functions uh, have the following outputs okay so at, at round d some context came and uh, the context was passed to each of these four functions and the four functions produced uh, these four uh, hey show uh, the first function said hey, show add one a, sorry a2 second one function also said take a2 the uh, third and fourth said take a4 okay now let's say the exp3 uh, uh, algorithm you know remember it's a uh, it's maintaining weights or functions and so it picks one of these functions right based on the weights so let's say it chose arm arm e1 right and let's say arm e1 said you can see arm e1 said a2 so let's actually play uh, uh, you know add a2 so we we play we show the add a2 and it also got clicked okay so in the sense it got a positive reward okay so there's a couple of things happen in this illustration now the benefit of context is that i can uh, do something different than what exp3 would have done so what would exp3 would have done hey exp3 would have said hey you got some reward uh, some reward and i'm going to divide that by the probability of that you choosing that uh, policy okay whatever the probability remember we were doing this uh, in exp3 definition some x tilde and then all the other arms get reward of zero okay and that's how i would get all the four numbers and then i'll just update the weights of these four policies that i'm, that I'm maintaining that's what exp3 would do but the benefit benefit of context is uh, can be exploited as, as you know as follows right we can do better why so what can we do better is because is that this reward that we got uh, because of playing uh, policy e1 or function e1 that can also be translated or transferred to updating uh, the weight for e2 as well why is that because e2 chose the same action as e1 okay. so e1 and e2 so chose the same action so while updating the weight for e1 and e2 we're gonna take into account that e1 and e2 said the same said the same action okay so that gives us a better reward so you don't have to so what what, what are we doing here um, we are basically kind of trying to make as much efficient use of a feedback as possible to update the weights of our policies okay uh, whereas the vanilla xp3 would not have done that it would have just assigned a uh, updated weight for uh, e1 and zero rewards for everybody else but because we know that these policies are producing the same actions we can actually update the weight for the second guy as well and so it, it so basically with one observation we could update two weights basically okay so so that's basically uh, where you're kind of gaining more information per interaction so that's the benefit of uh, context um, because the same context gave to uh, the, the, under the same context these two chose the same action okay? and that's why they are similar for this context and so the reward if one of them is chosen can also be transferred to the other other, other uh, similar policies so that's the idea um, so with that uh, there is an algorithm in the literature uh, not very practical uh, relatively speaking but for our illustration uh, it makes sense. So it's called the exp4 algorithm. Okay? And that's why I had introduced the exp3 before. The exp4 algorithm, uh, as we saw in the previous slide, exactly does what we discussed, which is maintain weights on the policies, okay? maintain weights on the functions. Now you can say, hey, how can I enumerate functions? If you think of linear functions, right? How can I enumerate all linear functions, right? It, it's very hard. So imagine uh, if you want to enumerate uh, linear functions in two variables, then there will be two coefficients. Uh, then there will be so many. So it's on the 2D plane, there's so many coefficients, right? Uh, so you can imagine enumeration is not possible, but let's say we had, we were able to enumerate our functions. Okay. So for every function in a set of functions, I can put a weight on them. So that means I only have to have like hundred functions or 50 functions or some, some finite number. Then uh, I can just run this algorithm very similar to exp3 where I'm, I'm doing exactly what I said in the previous slide, which is that many of these functions for the same context may take the same action. 
and therefore i should be able to learn more per interaction uh, than doing like uh, something like uh, something like uh, uh, exp3 or bandit setting okay so so what exactly is happening so let's say we observe some context xp then for every action uh, every action every each one of the k actions i'm going to get a get a uh, probability okay that probability is going to be hey what are the weights of uh, what are the weights of all those policies who all are suggesting the same action okay remember if if i have uh, 50 policies 10 of which are all saying hey let's take the same action then i'm just adding up the weights of those 10 guys because i want to know hey what's the probability of uh, suggesting this action a okay divided by the weights of all, all policies this is the same as before as exp3 it's just that you know multiple policies can say that multiple functions can say the same policy same action and so we are adding that up and similarly similar to exp3 we're just adding some small bias so that every action is taken at least a little you know with some small probability and then since I added a p min, so there has to be one minus something p min. So uh, it happens to be one minus k times p min. And so that's something uh, I need to add. Okay. So, okay. So I got a probability of each action. Uh, once I have computed this, then I can sample from the probability distribution. Okay. So forget about the exact definition of p min, it's just some small uh, constant, depends on the size of the function space. Now draw an action from p, uh, this uh, probability distribution. And then we observe a reward. Okay. So we observe a reward. Now we'll do exactly what we talked about in the previous slide. This reward, we're going to attribute it to every, each one that suggested action A. Okay. This reward will attribute it to everybody who said action A. And so that way we are learning about multiple policies at the same time. Okay. So update for each policy. Uh, if the policy suggested action A, we're going to do an update. If it didn't uh, suggest the uh, action A, then we're going to leave the weights as is. Okay. So that's, that's the, uh, Take the previous weight and add some uh, uh, add some multiply with, with this term here, and it's the same thing. So reward divided by the probability of taking that action is what is being configured here. Okay. It's very similar to exp 3s update. So that's exp four. I don't think I have a illustration of simulated experiment here, uh, but this is an example of a contextual valid algorithm. So you can see that it's, it seems very different from uh, a supervised learning technique where here we are really enumerating over each. Uh, keeping a weight over each function, possible function in my hypothesis class, and then doing a training step at every uh, iteration, every interaction. That's like a really extreme case. Okay. Um, if you compare to supervised learning, if you had full information, okay, then what you can do, think of the online setting with full information, then you can have a, you don't have to do x 4 in that case. What you can do is, um, uh, you can actually train every, uh, after every interaction, you get the true label and you, you have a feature, you have one extra data point, you can retrain, rerun regression, rerun random forest, you can get a new model, make another prediction, uh, and then you get new feedback, full information feedback, and then uh, do that. So you can actually just do supervised learning in an incremental way. Okay? But the whole complexity with uh, contextual bandits and uh, supervised learning is that we have bandit feedback. We only know reward for what we did. We don't know what could have happened if we did something else. Okay, So that is what is uh, going to cause uh, issues if you use supervised learning techniques when you get uh, binary feedback. Okay? The data set is basically biased. It's biased based on what you did before. And so you may have good estimates of some uh, of the things that you did before, but very bad idea of something else you could have done. You don't know what, what would pan out. Okay? And so that's why it leads to uh, I mean, uh, bad learning if you just use uh, supervised learning as is. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, uh, so with that, let me uh, wrap up actually, uh, we are ahead of time or not, oh, we are, okay. Uh, um, so what we're gonna, uh, I'm just gonna wrap up uh, in terms of the high level context of what we covered today and what we'll do right after spring break. Um, we are trying to move towards reinforcement learning. Okay? And, and that's because contextual balance formulation is also not enough, which means that supervised learning is not enough, okay? uh, which you know, by default also means supervised learning is not enough. And, and let me mention that in why this diagram. So multi unbalanced was just about, hey, no features. Every action leads to some reward. I just don't know a priori which action is the one which leads to highest mean reward or, or you know, on average performs the best. And so I'm going to do in a judicious way, figure out which action performs the best and kind of bias myself towards it as much as possible. Okay. 
that's multi arm bandit a contextual bandit is just saying hey there's some state or feature vector or context that's input based on that i need to figure out an action you can think of exp exp4 as an approach to go from the state to action that action led to some reward okay it's not just the action that led that led, led to the reward okay so the act, it's not just reward is on, not only dependent on action but also on the state right if the user in some good mode and you take some good some action maybe there is some reward and the user let's say is in bad mode and you take some action maybe there's some different reward okay, for the same action so of course the action is determined by both sorry the reward is determined by determined by both the action and the state okay that's why there's an arrow uh, that the action influences reward as well as which state you are in influences reward okay which state uh, not you but like the, the environment is in is uh, influences reward so that's contextual bandit uh and and um, we're not using this so this reward is bandit feedback again it's not a full information setting so that's why you can't just uh use it for supervised learning easily okay uh there are you know heuristics that you can use but we didn't discuss that uh here now what is going to change right so what is going to change is the following right so what changed from this pre in the center block to the bottom block is that now there is a loop from action to state okay and there is a dotted line from action to reward okay so what is going on there are two things going on first is that your action influences what comes next okay so think of the self driving case right so you you know if you as an agent are going to swear you know take an action just turn the thing wheel to the left that's going to lead to the next camera input i mean let's say the camera input is looking at the street and it's going to now look at the uh, right hand side uh, sorry left hand side right so so let's say the camera feed is the state right so your action has influence on what comes next okay not just that your action could have a long term impact uh, could have a delayed impact on the reward okay you uh, accelerating now may have an impact you know 10 seconds later or maybe 5 uh, minutes later you missed a, you missed an exit and therefore you you reached your destination uh, half an hour late okay so there's going to be long term impacts of your action okay so which is not present in the contextual bandit setting and neither in the multi arm bandit setting of course people have studied variations in the previous settings with some long term impact and with some state information like so state dependence like this but the vanilla versions of multi arm bandit and contextual bandit there is no such these two phenomena are not there okay so it's really iid thing the reward uh, so the state has nothing to do with the next state that i see here the state may depend on action that that i take okay and the action's consequences could be long term and so when i am taking an action now i need to be for, i need to be uh, judicious i need to be forward looking hey if i study today i may you know get some uh, 100000 job if i don't study today you know i may get something else right there's a long term consequence right so and so your action is determined by what you think you know which eventual reward you can get uh so that's uh, uh something new and so that's i guess uh, is what a reinforcement learning paradigm or framework captures and then we'll see some simple we'll set up the problem uh use uh, learn a tool called uh, mock audition process to kind of describe the problem and then we we can talk about via that description we can talk about solution approaches to reinforcement learning okay um yeah so let me summarize uh, for today what we do uh, we looked at ab testing as a way to introduce um take actions basically make decisions and and decisions can be uh, could uh, could be simple as website a versus website b or it could be complicated uh may need a lot of interactions okay and that's because interactions are wasteful because it's not adaptive to the previous interactions previous feedback is uh, based on idea or actually it's, it's equivalent to randomized control trial actually let me just put it that way same as it's the same as split testing or bucket testing and so on uh basically you need to uh tag this along with the appropriate hypothesis test generally okay and it, it depends it it may vary depending on the quantity that you are measuring it could be a two sample t test or it could be something else okay next we looked at two new online machine learning problems multi arm bandits and contextual bandits in fact the contextual bandit approach is exactly what uh, they did in the um uh in the msn.com example where they showed a relative lift of clicks or whatever right so the they didn't apply exp4 algorithm they used something else but uh that's how so they were getting user context they were figuring out what articles to show and they were just showing a improvement in the reward which is the clicks and all that um but the last point in the last 
five minutes or so, we said that contextual bias is a special case of reinforcement in learning where a couple of arrows are missing, right? The, these arrows are missing. So action doesn't impact state in the contextual binary setting. Actions don't have long-term consequences in the contextual binary setting, okay? The moment you have those two, you, it's called, it can be characterized as a reinforcement learning setting and which we will cover next time. Um, okay, so I think uh, with that, let me pause here. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Okay, then uh, we will stop here and